Good evening, everyone. We're very excited to have tonight Dr. Doug Tallamy presenting on creating a homegrown national park. Dr. Tallamy um, has been a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware, which is about an hour south of Philadelphia, um, for 40 years with many grad students and uh, students. And um, he has the best-selling author of uh, two books. The first one from 2007, Bringing Nature Home, which I recommend is the first one if you're still, if you're just going to get into his books. And then more recently, Nature's Best Hope last year. So um, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Tallamy. Let me just put up a few more um, thank yous. Um, uh, let's see. I want to thank the co-sponsors. Thanks to Orange Audubon's co-sponsors for tonight's program. Seminole Audubon, Tarflower Chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society, and two anonymous generous donors. All right. I'm turning it over now to you, Dr. Tallamy. Okay. Thanks very much, Deborah. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, how to create a homegrown national park tonight. But before we do that, I want to return to what happened on much of the East Coast, not this past fall, but the, the uh, year ago fall. We had what we call an oak mast, where the members of the red oak group all got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I stared at it. And I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn, first a chewed little hole and forced its head through. Uh, and then forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze, kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy, finally plopped down. Now this is a da dangerous time for this insect larvae because a lot of things want to eat it. So it gets to safety by squirming and wiggling below the soil, it takes about 30 seconds, where it stretches in all directions and forms a little chamber. And then within that chamber it converts itself to a pupa and it stays there for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. This is what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think they have big noses, but uh, that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down at the tip there. Uh, and they take those mouth parts and they chew a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg in that hole, and that's how the larva gets into the acorn. But you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the next year like most insects would? because it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. And if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. That of course leaves a hole in the acorn, a true vacuum and nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the vacated uh, holes made by acorn weevils. And if they find a brand new acorn, uh, they're excited because their old acorns falling apart. So they tell everybody time to move the colony. Uh, and they get busy. It takes about 30 minutes, but everybody carries an egg or a larva or something else into the new acorn. They post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. Well, about this time, my wife says, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? What I'm trying to tell you is that is just one of literally millions of very specialized relationships that comprise most of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They, they grab uh, acorn in the fall and they fly up to two miles away from the parent tree, then tap it below the surface of the ground. The idea is to get it again in the wintertime for food, but they forget where they put a lot of those acorns. And each jay ends up planting literally thousands of, of uh, new oak trees every single year. Found out this year what is pollinating witch hazel. I guess you don't have witch hazel in Florida, but uh, we certainly have it up here. It's a, it's a strange shrub bush that blooms after frost in the fall. All the leaves are down and that's when it blooms and everybody wonders what's pollinating witch hazel. Well, it turns out it's a, uh, a group of moths called winter moths that fly very late. Things like the bicolored sallow. I caught a bicolored sallow on Christmas Eve this year. Uh, and they're the primary pollinators. So I don't know whether witch hazel is blooming late to take advantage of winter moths or whether winter moths are flying late to take advantage of witch hazel. But at this point, they're taking advantage of each other. You won't have breeding pileated woodpeckers anywhere near you if you don't have a lot of carpenter ants because that's what they rear their young on. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have Basilia. 
That is the only pollen that that particular bee can rear its young on. And pollen specialization turns out is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them are highly specialized on particular, the pollen of particular plant genera. So for example, where I live, there are 13 species of native bees that can only reproduce in the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have uh, Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head and on and on and on. Nature truly is a series of very specialized relationships. But today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy uh, heard that the state of Arizona was going to be mining the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon and he looked out over the edge and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem today, of course, is that we don't have the option of leaving most of the country as it, it was, uh, because we haven't. Uh, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We've, we've tilled it. We've drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the U.S., which is uh, four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers. You might recognize this one and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We have introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents. In short, we have carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other such remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done that? Well, I guess we thought the earth was so big that we could, we could, it's our nest. We could foul it forever without any consequences. But of course we were wrong. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this at a pretty regular clip now. Uh, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of the North American bird population gone. And now the UN's predicting we're going to lose a million species to extinction, possibly within the next 20 years. And I love the way they report this as if it's just another headline. They might as well say we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline. That's not an option, folks. Losing this many species is simply not an option. Well, I could go on talking about the pox that, that we humans have delivered upon the, the environment, and that's upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that's going to take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, uh, the, the great E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus, uh, probably the most famous biologist alive today, told us what it would mean if we were to lose our insects. And he did that way back in 1987 with this paper called The Little Things That Run the World. And his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if insects were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. And if most of the flowering plants disappeared, that would, that would drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats. <clears throat> so drastically that the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, and even many of our freshwater fish, they would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the of the earth would um, rot as opposed to, uh, right now we have uh, insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients, but if we lost them, we just have bacteria and, and fungi to do that job. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the natural world because the, it's, it's healthy ecosystems that produce what we call ecosystem services, the things that keep us alive. This is what, what uh, plants deliver for us and everything else as well, like oxygen. They produce oxygen. That's pretty important. They clean water. They slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important uh, these days these days. It's plants that are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, using the carbon 
in that molecule to build their, their tissues, and then they pump the extra carbon into the ground. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Plants build topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. Important thing. So designing landscapes like this that, that um, prevent the production of ecosystem services is simply not an option. It never was a good option, but today we've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on, on the planet. Um, we need more ecosystem services now than ever before. We can't afford to waste the earth in huge swaths like this. Now, there were visionaries through the ages that uh, recognized that we humans needed to rec work on our relationship with planet earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups that uh, have learned how to do that pretty well. But our huge Western societies, our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We, we habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely ruin an area. Then we move to another area, completely ruin that. And of course, uh, Aldo Leopold recognized that is not a sustainable relationship with the earth. So he had, he had a dream that we humans were actually capable of developing what he called a land ethic. In his dream, we would, we would use land, uh, we'd farm it, lumber, lumber it, graze, mine, do all the things we needed to do, but we'd learn to do it gently without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called a land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he didn't talk about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in, in uh, the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, and it's still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have seen it as an option. But what I'm going to argue tonight is that living with nature not only is an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked almost exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We now need to save nature, to reconstruct it, really, where we've dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that's most of the planet. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not just exist, but thrive. Where are we gonna start? Well, let's go back to private property. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignored privately, private property, we would fail because we wouldn't be working on nearly enough of the land. But there are, uh, a number of places where that, that could act as important conservation centers that we don't typically think of them as today. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? There's 21 million acres in, in power and pipeline rights of ways. Another 3 million uh, acres in, in railroad rights of ways. And another 17 million acres in roadsides. We've got 2 million acres of golf courses, 3 million acres of airports. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are huge areas. Then we have all the places where we live, both in rural areas and suburbia and our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those types of landscapes. Uh, so that's 599 million acres if you add it up, where we're really not doing conservation, but we could be. How big is 599 million acres? Well, it's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, Texas combined. So not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We've got plenty of places we can do conservation. What I'm really talking about is rebuilding nature in, in the areas where we've dismantled it. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to start with the, the building blocks of nature, the, the species that are most important, the species that other species depend on. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the most important ones. And two of the most important groups uh, are, are right here. We've got the flowering plants, which we've decided we need, but you're not going to have them without the pollinators to keep those plants around. It's those plants that are capturing the energy from the sun and turning it into food, which is now in their leaves. But if we don't get that food from the leaves of the plants to animals, it's stuck in the leaves and that there is no food web, no animals around. 
And most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants and that's something typically is insects. But it turns out that, that the insects that are transferring more energy to animals than any other type of, of plant eater are caterpillars. Caterpillars are essential to, uh, to do viable terrestrial food webs. So if we design landscapes without caterpillars, most of the energy remains locked up in, in the leaves uh, and you don't have a viable food web. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, they are seed eaters during the winter time. At least 50% of their diet uh, is seeds. And that's why we see them at our feeders so often. But when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds. That's very common in our birds. Babies cannot eat seeds. So the chickadees switch to insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that's true, but this is a, a citizen science project that one of my PhD students did recently, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers to take pictures of birds during the, uh, the breeding season when they were carrying prey items to the nest. And the object was to, they were gonna send her the pictures and she was going to identify the, the prey items in the beak and reconstruct the nestling diets from those pictures of the common bird families in North America. And that's what you see here. Um, the green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families that she had enough data for, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen to our breeding birds if we took caterpillars out of the system? Most of them wouldn't be able to breed at all. So it's something special about caterpillars. What is it? Why do birds like them so much? Uh, well, for one thing, they're soft. Think of this guy as, as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is chitin, it's exoskeleton, cuticle, it's undigestible. The birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your baby without fear of injuring them. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, they're pretty rough. Their beak's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. Uh, one medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 ap aphids or get one large caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in protein, very high in fat. They have a low percentage of chitin compared to uh, most other insects, particularly beetles. There are a lot of beetles out there, but beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Most of the beetle is undigestible, and a lot of beetles have very sharp edges. And finally, it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because uh, I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate, and birds are vertebrates, and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, uh, yet we vertebrates have to get those carotenoids from plants because they are essential components of our diet. And that's why my wife, uh, Cindy, makes sure they have access to lots of, of uh, carrots so I can get my beta carotene and lots of tomatoes so I can get my lycopene and lots of whatever that is so I can get my lutein. And uh, when she succeeds, uh, I eat lots of carotenoids and they stimulate my immune system. Good thing these days. I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. They're also... Uh, antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this prothonotary warbler, who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. And he takes those lutein's, makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids? From what they eat, but uh, the carotenoid content of various bird prey items is not at all equal. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more correct carotenoids than other types of, of insects. Third bar uh, are orthopteroids, things like grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. Far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars that eat the green leaves where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. Uh, so the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does carotenoid content influence prey choice when birds are, are rearing their young? Well, Ashley did another study to, to answer that question. With bluebirds, uh, she put GoPro cameras on the rooftops of bluebird boxes, and those cameras took a picture once every second. Uh, and the object was to get a picture of the, the bluebirds as they flew in with a prey item in their, their beak. 
she had a lot of GoPro cameras and a lot of Bluebird boxes, and she did it for three years. So she had well over a million pictures to, to wade through. But out of the million pictures, she got 7,628 that were good enough to identify the prey. And then we could look at the carotenoid content. And she found, sure enough, caterpillars are brought back to the nest more than anything else, and they've got the highest level of carotenoids, followed by those orthopteroids, which are the next, next highest. And then everybody else is nestled way down here. Pretty good relationship. Um, so all of this suggests that, that caterpillars may not be optional parts of, of bird diets. It's really suggesting they are essential parts of bird diets, which means let's just, let's generalize and say birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees to answer that. They are good model systems and represent what a lot of birds are doing. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get, get the birds to the point where they leave the nest till they fledge. And that depends on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. So, you know, many more thousands than that. And if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, and you do, because that's pretty much what we have left in an awful lot of places, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because they forward it. The, Birds forage about uh, 50 meters from the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if you landscape in a way that does not provide all of those caterpillars to the chickadees, that's called insect decline. And it's really starting to look like bird decline is directly related to insect decline. We looked at the data from Rosenberg et al, uh, uh, who they were the group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds up into two groups, the species that require insects at some point of their life history, usually when they're breeding, and the species that don't require insects. So things like the uh, doves and finches that can actually reproduce on seeds. They actually gained a, a few, few uh, numbers during the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects on average lost 10 million individuals per species. This does not prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that there's an important link there. So I'm concluding uh, that we need to landscape in a way that creates a lot of caterpillars uh, for the birds, but for, for many other things as well. And of course, that is, is the, just the opposite goal of, of the way we have landscape in the last hundred years. We've considered plants to be just decorations, so we didn't want anything to eat them. So we landscaped in a way that had no insects and they were pretty, but they were pretty much deadscapes. So how do you add caterpillars to your, your landscape? You do that by adding the plants that support those caterpillars, that make those caterpillars, which seems easy enough, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we pick. We have to choose the ones that are really good at making caterpillars. Uh, why do I say that? Well, the monarch butterfly uh, tells us why we have to be fussy because most caterpillars are fussy. Uh, you know, you can have all the ornamental plants you want from Asia or South America in your yard. You can have Brazilian pepper. You can have, have uh, you know, any of those ornamental plants, camellias that, that uh, we all love so much in our yards. And you won't make a single monarch butterfly because the only thing they're going to reproduce on is milkweed. That's the only option. And monarchs are not exception. Most of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. And they're host plant specialists because plants have made them that way because plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's really effective offense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are simply too well protected. And if you don't believe me, go outside and, and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not going to like it. Uh, they're really well protected. There's a reason it takes, it, it's, it's hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know they're, they're toxic. That's my little joke. Um, but we do know that, that insects eat plants. That's not a joke. How do they get around the chemical defenses in their, in their leaves? This is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. A, a single insect uh, species cannot adapt 
to all of those types of, of chemical defenses. So they pick one or two and they get really good at getting around those. They develop the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. But the, it takes a long period of evolutionary history for all of those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. And that's why our insects are so poor at eating plants from other continents that we bring in as ornamentals, and then many of which escape and become uh, serious invasive species in our natural areas. So what I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to, to rebuild a, a food web in an area where we've already destroyed it, we need to choose the plants that are going to support that food web. And we need to choose them carefully because most plants don't. And I'm going to give you three examples of how to do that or how well it works when you do do that, starting with our house here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I'm sitting in this window right, right up there. This is what it looked like when we moved in, uh, shortly before we moved in. We, we uh, got a piece of a farm that was broken up into 10-acre lots. Uh, and it was a very old farm. It had been farmed for 300 years, totally exhausted. The last thing they did was mow it for hay, which they, they sold to the mushroom industry. But when you mow, mow for hay in my area, you're really mowing all the Asian uh, invasive plants that are here. Multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and calorie pear and privet and barberry and miscanthus. And they're all there. They're all scapies by my garden, by the way. You mow that and then you call that hay. So when we stop, when they stopped mowing, when we bought the property, this is what came back. Autumn olive, oriental bittersweet, all of the, the invasives uh, on 10 acres, big solid mass. So if you own property and it's choked with non-native plants, don't give up. This is Cindy, this is my wife. She's getting ready to clear that 10 acres and she did. It's a lot of work, there's no doubt about it. Um, fortunately, she enjoyed doing it. She, she sticks with it, I mean, because they keep coming back from our neighbor's yards, uh, but you can succeed, so don't, don't give up. What was I doing while Cindy was working so hard? Well, I was telling her she was doing a great job, uh, but I also was putting plants back. That's, that's important. Uh, and I did it selfishly. I have a little hobby of taking pictures of caterpillars I've never seen before. I like caterpillars. Uh, and I started with the Canadian outlet. Could I, could I attract the Canadian outlet to our property? Well, the, the way to do that, of course, is to attract the adult that's going to lay eggs on its host plant. Its host plant happens to be meadow rue. And we didn't have any meadow rue. I'm sure there was meadow rue here hundreds of years ago before the whole area was farmed to death, but uh, meadow rue long gone. So I got some seeds of meadow rue from someplace and I planted them. They grew very nicely. Um, but, you know, I, I wasn't at all confident that the Canadian outlet would be able to find my meadow rue. Or if it did, maybe it would take years to do that. So I didn't go out and check my, my meadow rue plants for about a month and a half after I planted them. When I finally did go out, uh, they were almost defoliated by Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. And now I have a, a, a good population of meadow rue and Canadian outlets. So that worked really well. We've added two species to the property. Same thing with the goldenrod stowaway, this beautiful yellow moth. Uh, that's a misnomer. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. Ditch daisy. I did know where Biden's aristosa was, but in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I went and got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew really nicely. We had to wait a year for the, for the moth to find our Bidens, but it did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So we've added four species now. Wanted hackberry emperor. Why? Because it's a butterfly that ought to be here. Uh, but as its name uh, suggests, hackberry emperor requires hackberry and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry. We had to wait three, four years for the butterflies to find our hackberry. Excuse me. I walked by one of my hackberry trees uh, this June and on a single branch, there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars. So another big success. I didn't plant uh, goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the species that eat goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, beautiful caterpillar, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now here's one that hasn't come yet, the goldenrod flower moth, uh, and that's what its caterpillars look like. I don't know why it hasn't found our goldenrod, but it hasn't. So this is, this is anticipation. This is like uh, waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. One of these years, I'm going to go out and look at my goldenrod. I will find the goldenrod flower moth, and that will be a great year. I planted Virginia creeper. 
Um, it's a it's a wonderful, it's a great native plant. A lot of people don't like it. I don't know why. Uh, it can climb our trees without strangling them, without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's uh, an excellent host plant for, uh, particularly for the big sphinx moths that, cat that cardinals reproduce on so frequently. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx. These all feed on Virginia creeper. I wanted to see if I could attract a zebra swallowtail. Now, uh, this was a real challenge because we live 26 miles north of the northernmost zebra swallowtail population that I know of in, in any place around here. Um, and of course, zebra swallowtails are pawpaw specialists. We didn't have any pawpaw, but I planted pawpaw. And then I just wondered, yeah, I dared them. Could you make it over that 26 miles and actually colonize my pawpaw? Um, well, they took me up on the dare. Took them nine years, though. We had to wait nine years for our, our uh, zebra swallowtails to come. And while we were waiting, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx. And of course, we get lots of pawpaws every year. Wanted the double tooth prominent just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. It's a specialist on elm. So we planted American elm. They came right away. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's pretty. I like beauty just like anybody else. So we planted evening primrose. The adults come and they, they, spend the day with their head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And we planted lots of, of oak trees. Now these are just examples of the plant lineages we've added to our property. I wanna focus on oaks for a while though, because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old, it's enormous. And you know, a lot of people think that your tree has to be enormous before it can contribute to your property. I hear people say all the time, I'm not gonna plant it out because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, if you enjoy what the oak is doing for you, you can enjoy it the very first year. And I can say it with confidence because I planted my oaks as acorns or two foot bare root whips. Acorns free, by the way, bare root whips, $1.50 each. And immediately they started to attract the moths that run the, the food webs that support the birds in my yard. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicalema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property, including the Bernie Mean caterpillar. Uh, you get this one in the in the winter time because it wears gloves, uh, and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the uh, the leaves here, and here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. So you don't have to wait forever for your oaks to start to contribute to your local food web. Here's a picture of the house, pretty much as it looks now. I'm still sitting in this window up here, um, just to convince you. You know, we're very traditional. We have lawn, but we have a lot of plants too. Uh, and every time I add a plant lineage to the, the property, there's a good chance I will attract new species of moths. And four years ago, I, I um, made it a goal to take a picture of every species of moth I could find on the property. Big job. And I'm not done. But so far, I've got 1,031 species of moths. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. 1,031 species of moths. That's more species of moths on our 10 acres than all the species of birds in, in uh, the U.S. and North America. Now we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land area, we have 40% of all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And because many of these are bird food, we have recorded 59 species of terrestrial birds that have bred on our 10 acres. You know, in the, in the fall, the World Wildlife Fund said this, we have lost two thirds of the earth's wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking, not at our house. I, I am sure we have increased biodiversity at our house by more than two thirds, and it didn't take nearly that long simply by putting the plants back. So I'm sharing this so that you don't don't buy these these uh, frightening headlines as if they're they're irreversible. They are not irreversible. We can we can turn this around if we all uh, take Earth stewardship a little bit more seriously and put the plants back that support the life around us. But I know what you're thinking. We have 10 acres. 
You might live in suburbia with less than that. Will it work on a smaller piece of property? Well, let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, uh, where they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less property than, than Cindy and I have. They're in a typical development. All their, their uh, neighbors had the big lawns and, and the ornamental plants. Well, the first thing they did was get rid of the serious invasive plant in, in Kirkwood, Missouri, which is bush honeysuckle. It's everywhere. Uh, and then they put in a lot of native plants and they also put in a, a water feature called, they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that were using their yard. There are up to 149 bird species that they have recorded in their yard, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house on much less acreage. So does it work on smaller properties? Yes, it does. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because right over this wall here is uh, one of the um, runways of the O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one-tenth of an acre, three times smaller lot than the average lot size in North America. Uh, and she's not connected to any natural area. So she's a little island in Chicago. She did the same thing the Terpstras did. She, she pulled out her invasive plants put in 60 species of native plants, including a water feature for those birds. And then she sat back on that tiny little property and counted the birds that were using her, her property. She's up to 117 species, including a woodcock, including a great horned owl that stopped by the other day. She sent me a picture. Uh, and there's, there's her woodcock in case you don't believe her. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Chicago to Pam's house and check it out. What about city centers though? 82% of us live in cities now. Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa. People call it butterfly weed. But this reminds me, we've got a serious marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds. I wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed anymore. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. So staring at Monarch's Delight 2014. And the first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bees. Uh, I know they're leafcutter bees because they've got pollen on their tummy, not on their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very strict requirements, so they can't be in a particular area. They need pollen, they need nectar, but they also need soft leaves because they snip the edges out of those leaves and leave these little semicircles. Then they roll up the leaf that they snipped out into a tube and they stuff it full of pollen, lay an egg on it, uh, and uh, that's how they reproduce. Then they stuff that whole, whole package into a crack or a crevice. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Here's three packages together stuffed into a, a, a crack picture taken by, by Heather Holm, and that's how leaf butter cutter bees reproduce. Well, there was a red bud plant or tree right next to Monarch's Delight, and I'm sure that's why there were leaf cutter bees there. I'm pretty sure that's why there were bumblebees there as well. Bumblebees, of course, overwinter as queens, so when they come out in the spring, they have no helpers. They have to, they have to start that colony all by themselves, so they need copious amounts of, of forage material, blooms, uh, to get that colony going readily. Otherwise, the colony fails. And that's exactly what Redbud provides. And pretty sure that's why there were bumblebees there. And then I saw a monarch. Actually, I saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch's Delight. Now, remember, this is 2014. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. That was the low point in the uh, monarch population for the East. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left in 2013. So this was uh, this was the next year, and here it was June, which is very early to see monarchs this far north. Uh, so I was I was excited. Um, you know, maybe we weren't going to lose the monarchs after all. Why were they there? Well, they had monarchs delight, uh, but they also had another species of milkweed. I think it's purple milkweed. So they had forage, but they also had host plants to lay their eggs on. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. And that's the High Lane. It's an elevated railroad that was abandoned many years ago. Uh, somebody went up and looked at it. There were a lot of native plants that had seeded in on their own. They were doing just fine. So they decided to make it a tourist destination. And it's become a huge success. Literally millions of people go to the High Line every year. And this is the extent of the nature. It's a strip of plants along the edge of this, this uh, abandoned railroad, 30 feet above the taxis, right in the middle of Manhattan. This is Rick Dark. He was always after me to go to the High Line to see the beautiful plants. Well, I'm not much of a city boy. And you know, when I go see a beautiful plant and nothing's using it, that's actually depressing to me. And that's, that's what I thought I was gonna find in the High Line. I couldn't imagine anything finding it in the middle of Manhattan, but I was totally wrong. 
Somebody just finished a, a study looking at the native bees that are using the Highline right now. They're up to 30 species. Uh, so it was, it was uh, a, a wonderful day. It was actually only there 20 minutes, but I saw all that. And it convinced me that if thoughtful native plantings can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, we can do this pretty much anywhere. But there are four things we need to think about if we're going to be successful. Uh, and one of them is we have to reduce the area we have in lawn because we've got too much lawn. We've got more than 40 million acres of lawn, which is the size of New England dedicated to failed ecosystems. I mean, this is, there's no ecosystem services being produced here. Uh, and we know why we have lawn. It's a status symbol. It convinces uh, our neighbors that, that you know, we're good citizens. And we're with, with the culture uh, when we have lawns like this. But um, we can keep our status symbol. Let's cut the area of lawn in half. We can still manicure what we keep, but let's put some plants back and produce some ecosystem services right at home. And if we do that in half the area that's in, in, in lawn, if we do it at home, that'll give us 20 million acres we can use to create a new national park at home that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, plus Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains, add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park is going to be the biggest park in the country. What are the benefits of putting a park right where you live? Uh, there are a number of them. First of all, you can, you can develop a personal relationship with some aspect of the natural world at your own pace, your own time. All you have to do is go outside. And you can do it by avoiding crowds. If you go to a real uh, 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 national park, of course, there are millions of people there with you. It's free. There's no admission uh, charge. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the, the pipe. No travel hassles. Uh, you get to experience the natural world alone. That's really important. I don't know how you're going to develop that personal relationship with the natural world unless you are alone. That's how that happens. And this is critically important for our kids. Our kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, we're working hard to, to expose them to nature. So we get, you know, we, we get a bus and put 30 kids on, on the bus with a, a teacher and they drive for an hour and they walk around a, a natural area. Teacher tells them not to touch anything and then they go home and that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have a park at home, all they have to do is go outside alone, no parental supervision, let them experiment, let them discover the world on their own, become attached to it, which is critically important because they are the future stewards of our planet. And if they don't care about what's out there, if they don't understand what they have to steward and why they have to steward it, they're going to be lousy stewards. Most of them will make it back alive. It's okay. And they might learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very small patch of nature. And it's not so nat natural, it's grass and, and a hedge. Uh, but there are anole lizards there. So she sent me this picture to, to show me how you hunt lizards. You get in the ground and you disguise yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Mm -hmm. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizards. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put them in an aquarium and you've got that personal relationship with that little piece of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be catching lizards on the ground the rest of her life. I don't think. Uh, but I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards uh, in, in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of that relationship. If you want your kids to do more than, than catch lizards, get this book, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti, which gives you dozens of examples of how to get your kids outside and expose them to that natural world right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, uh, go to our new website here, homegrownnationalpark.org, and get yourself on the map. Um, we're talking about, um, let's see, we're down here, right? You put your, your information in, uh, in the website uh, in, in terms of where you live and the amount of area that you're planting in natives, or you already have planted in natives, or was preserved when you moved on there. The amount of land that you are, are protecting and stewarding. And your area will light up on the map. And the object is to light up the whole country. Actually, you know, the goal is to, is to do this for 20 million acres. 
Um, but why stop there? Let's let's keep going. This is supposed. This is our attempt at at um, getting beyond the choir. I've I've been speaking to the choir for you know 12, 15 years now. Uh, but there's still a lot of people that don't have a clue how important the land they own is. And uh, if if they get on the map through competition with their neighbors, uh, that's great. We're seeing how it works. You can even get a little sign and, and stick it in your yard. You belong to Homegrown National Park. It doesn't mean you can't belong to Audubon at the same time, because first of all, we're free. And uh, if you if you belong to uh, Homegrown National Park, the services you need to do this are going to be supplied by by Audubon or the other groups. OK, we're going to shrink the lawn. What are we going to plant there where, where there was lawn? At least some of the plants we put there have to be what I call keystone species. Now, remember what a keystone is. You've got the Roman arch. The keystone is a stone right in the middle of that arch. If you take that stone out, the arch falls down. If you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. That's how important they are. We're talking about a few of the native plants that are making most of the food. There's just 5% of our native plant genera that are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives the food webs. 14% of our native plant genera are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives the food webs, which means 85% of our native plants that are out there aren't contributing all that much. I mean, they're important for diversity, but these, these are the big guys. Uh, think of, you know, when you build a house, you build it out of two by fours uh, and then you fill in the blanks. You don't build it out of, out of wallpaper or it's going to fall down. That's what the keystone plants are. They are the two by fours of your food web. So the question is no longer simply are, are natives better than non-natives. On average, they certainly are. But there are a lot of nat uh, natives that don't produce all that much. So the question really is, do we want to get the most ecologically productive plants into our yards that are making the most bird food um, or benign plants or even worse, the ecologically destructive plants, the invasive uh, ornamentals from someplace else that are, aren't making any bird food and then escape into our natural areas and, and ecologically castrate them? I get an email uh, occasionally from, from somebody who says, don't I know that ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, ginkgos from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. Uh, that makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Well, yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not our metric anymore. The metric is productivity. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They produce zero species of caterpillars in any kind of a practical way. There are two uh, rare host records of caterpillars nibbling on there, but I've never found one. What's going to produce more caterpillars than anything else? Uh, well, it says keystones plants, but in 84% of the counties of North America, oaks are number one. Where I live, 557 species of caterpillars on oaks. 900 species nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that. And this is an example of, of uh, the role of keystone plants in a particular landscape. So we'll use my yard. Remember, I've taken a picture of 1,031 moss species so far. Out of the 1,031 uh, species, um, 907 have known host plants. So there's over 100 that I don't know what they're eating. Out of the 907, 267 species use oaks. And we've got 69 genera of native woody plants on our property. And only one of them is, is Quercus, the oaks. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. Yet they're supporting almost 30% of our moss species diversity. And, and who knows how important they are to the breeding birds in our yard. Imagine what would happen if we took that single plant genus out of the, of the food web. It'd be a shadow of its former self. So how do you know what the keystone plants are where you live. Well, there's two sources. There's a native plant finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, and there's Audubon uh, plants for birds. Um, you can go there, you put in your zip code and the important plants for your county pop up. So uh, here, here are um, some of the keystone plants uh, for Orange County in Florida. Um, oaks, number one, followed by uh, native prunus, native cherries, native willows, uh, Notice I'm saying native, native maples, native native elms. That's because if I go to the nursery and I say, I want to buy a cherry, they'll sell me an, an ornamental cherry from Asia. Uh, I want to buy a willow. They'll sell me a weeping willow from, from Turkey. 
Um, even if I want to want to buy an oak, uh, chances are I'll get the Chinese oak or English oak because it's it's the nursery industry is still struggling with the concept that we actually want to buy North American plants. So they carry all those those uh, non-native ornamentals. These are native plant genera, but there are non-native members of those genera. And if we plant those, we're going to reduce caterpillar use, the production of bird food by 65 percent. We did that study. Here that the top um, herbaceous plants, goldenrods uh, number one, followed by the, you know, they split up asters into several genera, um, sunflowers. With those three alone, you can support over 40 species of, of specialist bees in your yard. Um, remember, we're gonna plant for specialist bees because the generalists will be able to use those plants as, as well. Uh, and if you don't have those three genera in your yard, th that's 40 species of bees that can't be there. Plus, they make a lot of caterpillars. Goldenrods alone make over, uh, I think it's 160 caterpillars nationwide, 110 where I live with, where I live. So keystone plants, we're going to shrink the lawn, put in keystone plants, attract a lot of insects, particularly moths that run our food webs to our yards, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which is not the goal. There's uh, a lot of research, particularly from Europe, that is now suggesting that light pollution at night is one of the major uh, causes of insect declines. And they kill insects a lot of ways through exhaustion, collision, incineration, dehydration. The bat comes and picks them off. Uh, the bright light blinds insects at night. Who knew? And it keeps them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, to me, this is actually really good news. Because if, if light pollution, if those lights we have on at night are actually one of the major causes of insect declines. It's one of the easiest things to reduce. Simply turn off your light, flick your switch. What could be easier? But I know what you're gonna say. I can't turn my night light off because uh, the bad man will come. Well, put a motion sensor on your night light so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna find out is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't wanna do that, Take the white light out of your security uh, uh, system and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is the best. Um, yellow wavelengths are the least attractive to night flying insects of any of the wavelengths. So if we all switched out our white lights for yellow LED lights, and I'm talking about the light over your garage, the light over your, your, your uh, back porch, overnight, we would save billions of insects and probably billions of dollars too, because that's of course very energy efficient. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn, put in keystone plants, turn out our lights, and then invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill all of our insects. Again, not the goal. Now, Mosquito Joe will say, well, this is okay because it's, it's a natural product. And he's right. It's pyrethroids from chrysanthemums. But cyanide is a natural product too, and it doesn't mean that it's okay for us. He'll also say it only kills mosquitoes. He's not even close on that one. It kills all the insects it comes in, in contact with. Mosquito Joe is methodically undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 10 years. The big thing is it doesn't work. When you, the studies have shown that this type of fogging kills about 10% of the adult mosquitoes uh, on the property. You need to kill 90% of the adult mosquitoes in order to control mosquitoes when you're attacking adults. Plus, he's expensive. The way you kill mosquitoes is in the larval stage. And this is a very convenient way that any homeowner can do, and it's cheap. You get a bucket, you fill it full of water, put some straw or hay in there, let it ferment for a couple days, and it becomes irresistible to ovipositing mosquitoes. They lay their eggs in the bucket. Then you get a mosquito dunk from the hardware store. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a uh, disease, a bacterium that attacks aquatic diptera. And you put it in the bucket and the larvae eat it and then they die. And only the mosquitoes die. So if you get a dragonfly in there, it doesn't hurt it a bit. Your dog can lick it. The birds can drink it. No problem. A much more targeted, much more effective way to control mosquitoes. Finally, we need to landscape in a way that allows all those caterpillars, all that bird food to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete the development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, it spins a cocoon and hangs from the branch, then it emerges as an adult and it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. 
but that's unusual. Most of the species, 480 of them, 94% drop from the tree as caterpillars when they're through growing and they wiggle their way underneath the ground and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And we mow and compact the soil around our trees to the point where it's so hard that the caterpillars can't get underground anyway. So this becomes an ecological trap. The adult moths come in, lay their eggs, the caterpillars grow, drop down and, and die. And the next generation is smaller and the next generation after that is gone altogether. I am convinced that the typical way we treat the landscape under our trees is one of the, another major cause of insect declines pretty much everywhere. And of course the cement uh, landscape is, is even less of a viable option. I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the, the profligate use of cement in our cities as a default landscape. That's just, uh, that's, that's laziness. And we know it's a terrible idea. It destroys our watersheds and it also releases a ton of CO2, uh, greenhouse gas. This is what most people do. You have a big tree, you put it in a lawn. Now, nobody studied what the caterpillar survivorship is in a situation like this, but I guarantee it's better in a situation like this, in a layered landscape. You have your tree and maybe you have a dogwood here and a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. It's a safe site. The caterpillar drops down. It can find the, the, the loose soil and get underground. It can find the leaves to spin its cocoon in. It's not going to be stepped on. It's not going to be mowed and survivorship will be much higher. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. Um, if you do that in Florida, I don't know. But this is what you do is you put flower beds around your trees and that's how you shrink your lawn. You're putting life into your, your uh, landscape uh, and creating those safe sites, very valuable for the birds, but you're also protecting your trees. They don't wanna be mowed right up to. They want uh, the, this wonderful type of, of treatment of the soil. This is where you use your, your uh, ground covers. So things like wild ginger or may apples or fir foam flowers or ferns. This is a hotel in Athens, Georgia. So it's a, it's, you know, it's a formal landscape, but this is red maple. The caterpillars fall down and they have a place to complete their development. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, has some very encouraging news about uh, our, our uh, landscape choices. And that is that there actually is room for compromise. We can still have viable food webs, even if we have some non-native plants. What she did was uh, look at the ability of landscapes dominated by native plants within this, the, the uh, beltway of Washington, D.C. to sustain chickadee populations compared to landscapes dominated by our typical introduced non-native uh, ornamentals. When landscapes were don dominated by those non-natives, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, the amount of food for the chickadees was reduced 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Uh, and it wasn't because there wasn't an S-box there. She had an S-box up in, in all of the, the lots. Uh, but the chickadees came, they looked around, and they knew there was not enough food there to actually rear their young. So they didn't occupy the box. If they did, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. The nests, if they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that data into all those data into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plants biomass in your yard from none to 100%. This is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the chickadees have to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this, at this rate, uh, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies than adults die, you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. Now, right here is where those, uh, those lines overlap. So generously speaking, you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native in your yard and still have a viable uh, uh, bird breeding population. But if you exceed 30%, if you get over into here, uh, it's that landscape's not producing enough food, not enough caterpillars, and your birds won't be able to be sustained. So I'm excited about this study for two reasons. Uh, this is the first time this has been measured for any bird anywhere. So anybody who doubts the, the importance of choosing the right plant for your landscape should check this study out. But it also, this is the area of compromise. You can have your camellia, you can have your, your ginkgo, you can have your, your favorite non-native plants as long as they're not invasive. 
and as long as they don't dominate your landscape and still have a viable breeding bird population. Uh, and that's good news to me because if my message was you can't have any non-native plants, very few people would listen. We love our non-native plants. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It is the absence of native plants. If we use a lot of native plants, we can tolerate these guys. Can native plants be used in formal designs? Of course they can. This is a, a, a garden in North Carolina. Uh, and they're adding native plants just to demonstrate you can have native plants in a formal garden. That's Joe Pye. Notice I didn't say Joe Pye weed. <clears throat> and they're going to send me a picture when they get a lot more, more natives in here. Remember, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the, the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. <laughs> Can you get a... a uh, pollinator garden into a traditional suburban lot like this without offending anybody. Of course you can just put a little fence around it. It's not very big, but it's beautiful. Had a lot of species in there services, a number of species of, of uh, native bees. Um, and if everybody does it, then, then you're, you're, you know, that's, that's a good um, contribution to pollinator sustainability. I don't like the way uh, you hear why we need pollinators. They always related to agriculture. Our bees are pollinating 30% uh, of our crops. That's not accurate. It's about 12% of our crops. Uh, but that's not why we need pollinators. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Forget our crops. A lot of people think if they don't live next to a, a farm, they don't need pollinators. Not so. We need pollinators every place we need plants, which is every place. How about this? A Drew Latham design, much bigger than the other one. Imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. And they're doing it more and more. Uh, Minnesota has a cost sharing program that encourages homeowners to replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate uh, Minnesota prairie plants. They pay you to do that. You know, in Florida, you've heard about the island, I don't know the name of it, that's paying residents to allow burrowing owls. Nest, nest in the front yards. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. You get paid to take care of an endangered species. Everybody would want one. Missouri and Fayetteville, Arkansas have a, a uh, bounty on calorie pear. This is one of the most invasive plants you can put in your yard. If you, if you uh, take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. Uh, and even uh, public utilities are getting in the act. Give you $100 coupons. This is San Antonio to get rid of uh, thirsty uh, non-native plants and put in natives. Buffalo, New York's giving people $100 coupons just to increase the percentage of natives. So it can happen. And of course, there's the lawn uh, replacement programs in the far west, particularly California. Up to $2 per square foot rebate by uh, taking out your thirsty lawn and putting in appropriate xeric plantings. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one is that, uh, you know, we like nature. We, we assume it's important, but we also assume it's not essential, that we can live without it. And that's the misstep. Because that means that whenever push comes to shove, whenever resources are in, in short supply, nature loses. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there was this wall sized poster there, which to me epitomizes what our society thinks of conservation. We want to save wildlife so future generations can ignore it. I can ignore it, can <laughs> appreciate it. That's what Teddy Roosevelt, um, that was his justification for creating national parks. We wanna save them so the future generations can, can appreciate them. Uh, and that's true. That's that's a good justification, but it's not good enough. Nature is not there just for entertainment. It's much more urgent. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It is essential. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Another misstep. And, and you know, we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation to just small areas where there aren't a lot of humans, we're going to fail because those areas are, are, there's just not enough of them. David Quammen has a, a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That is 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. 
Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance. Even our yards, even our roadsides, even our corporate landscapes, uh, even the edges of our agriculture. So what we need to do is glue our rug back together again. We've got to, we've got to not just create biological mm -hmm. carters by, by putting plants in these white areas so that animals, plants and animals can move back and forth between viable habitat. We want to create viable habitat right where we are right now by using those powerhouse plants, a diversity of them. We're going to start to share our spaces with nature. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists a few ecologists, a few conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. And I don't know why, because everybody on the planet is entirely dependent on the quality of Earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody on the planet bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? It doesn't make any sense to me. Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset was I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We've been great at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching what everybody's obligation is to planet Earth. And it doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but it does mean you can save it where you live. And I love this approach because it empowers each one of us. You know, the, the Earth's problems right now are huge and so many of us feel absolutely powerless, like there's nothing we can do. But that's not true. This is a case where the cliche is, is, is uh, accurate. A single person can make a difference. Go out in your yard, shrink your lawn, take out those invasive plants, put in some keystone uh, species, add a pollinator garden, do any one of those things. And you can see your ecosystem start to, to come alive again as a single person. It makes you an important cog in the future wheel of conservation. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think of the entire planet's problems. You will go crazy that way. Just worry about your piece of the earth that you can manipulate. If you own property, that's obvious where you're gonna start. You know, if everybody who owned property east of the Mississippi fixed that property up, we'd be 85% done. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Volunteer for a land conservancy or for a, a park or a preserve. They're all underfunded, understaffed. They'll love you. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and ultimately our own fate. So I've convinced my, my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Oh, that was so wonderful. Thank you so much, Doug. You're welcome. And let's have some good conversation. Everybody, please write your questions in the chat on Facebook. And in the meantime, I want to let you know a couple things. Um, there is a native plant sale March 6th by Public Fern Chapter at Stanford Garden Club. And on March 13th, the Tar Flower Chapter native plant sale at Lou Gardens Plant Sale. And to locate specific plants in nearby native plant nurseries, consult um, FAN, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. And of course, I'm gonna put up the native, to learn more about native plants in Florida, visit the Florida Native Plant Society, fnps.org. And you can find your local chapter there. Okay, so let's see what, what uh, questions have come in. We've got a couple nice comments outstanding from Randy and Mary, who, uh, by the way, Randy and Mary have seen 22 species of warblers on their 0.39 acres mm -hmm. in Orange County. I, I may have mentioned them to you. They're some of our top native plant landscapers and also good birders. So they're, they're That's wonderful. wonderful. 22 species. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's see. What questions do we have? Fantastic. We got a lot of nice comments. Um, somebody said, how do I, how do I get the birdie caterpillar? <laughs> how do you, oh, get the birdie caterpillar. <laughs> Actually, it's all over Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody have uh, any questions, um, uh, from Facebook, Susan? Susan's monitoring the Facebook and she's going to text them to me. Let's see. Um, most of the people were on. Okay, he, he asked to please repeat, repeat the books you mentioned, especially the ones for children. Oh, you didn't mention any for children. <laughs> well, there was one for families. 
Uh, yeah, there's there's the first. My first book was Bringing Nature Home. The second one is Nature's Best Hope. Um, there are a, a number of of children's books coming out now. I'm starting to make a list of them. I don't have it handy. Um, it's it's brand new. Writing a book about this this concept. So, uh, you know, if you send me an email, I can send you some some titles. Okay, um, but there was one that you mentioned for families. It seemed like. Um, Oh, 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 yeah. Getting your kids out. Yeah. Um, Nature Play at Home. Oh, yeah. Nancy Stranisti. You're right. Thank you. Um, uh, that's about how to do it. But there's actually, you know, the, the typical very young children's books with stories in them about native plants and, and, you know, bringing the birds home and things like that. So here's a good question. How long does it take before a plant can become considered native? <laughs> Not in your lifetime. Uh, that's a great question. You know, a lot of people think, you know, if it's here long enough, then our insects will adapt to it. Well, let's look at some some uh, data about that. The common reed, Phragmites, uh, is highly invasive plant. It's a genotype from Europe, and it was used as packing in the earliest ships that came over. So on the East Coast, it has been here for 400 years. Uh, how do we know when it when it becomes a native, when it acts like a native? So we go to where it is native, where it supports 175 species of insects. Well, here, after 400 years, it only supports five. So adaptation's happening, but very, very slowly. Uh, so when will it support 175 species over here? I don't know, 10,000 years, 100,000 years. Uh, that type of adaptation is very, very slow. So we should not count on our, our non-natives functioning like natives. In the meantime, you know, they've got these giant monocultures of, of Phragmites uh, all over the place, eliminating the native plants that do have sustainable relationships with our, our, our insects. Uh, so the, you know, waiting for adaptation is not going to solve the problem. Phragmites is native down here. You ha there is a native Phragmites, that's right. So I'm talking about the invasive genotype from Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how have you been successful in getting your neighbors and planting? <laughs> I hate that question. <laughs> you know, that that's one of the hardest things is to start, uh, you know, proselytizing to your, your neighbors. Um, imagine if your neighbor walked across the street and knocked on your door and said, you know, you're not living like me. I really want you to live like me. Um, they resist that. It's very important that you get along with your neighbors. So, uh, no, I've never, I've never told anybody that they have to, uh, they have to be like me. Um, I did have a, a neighbor, uh, my immediate neighbor, has also has ten acres of that farm that was broken up. Every single plant on that ten, 10 acres is a non-native plant. Uh, but he he sold it. He's he's gone, and now there's a new family in there, uh, and they're actually converting. They're hiring uh, Larry Weiner, was who's a very prominent uh, native meadow maker, to redo the ten acres, and they're going to get rid of the 32 uh, calorie pears. You know, did I have anything to do with that? I don't know. They do have my book. We never really talked about it, but. Um, when the decision comes from your neighbor themselves, it's going to go a lot better. One thing you can do, though, is to provide a good example and, uh, you know, lead by example. If they like your landscape, if they like uh, the, you know, the birds that are there, um, tell them the plants they put in their yard are, are bird feeders. And that could be another hook is birds itself. Got, what do we have? 79 million people that feed the birds. If you explain, you know, look, birds... They're not using the seed during the summertime. You want them to breed here. You've got to put in the plants that support them. And if they love the birds, uh, that can be enough. They just don't understand the relationship between plants and birds. So what's the, can you see these questions? No, okay. <laughs> all I see is my screen. <laughs> what is the largest size reasonable to plant an oak tree? I'm considering removing two pears and replacing with oak, but those pears are 20 years old. So it will be a big spot when they come out. Right. So what's the question? What do we, you're looking for a small yeah. oak or? Yeah. What, what's a reasonable size? Um, there are a lot of big oak species, but I was uh, surprised to find out not long ago that there are actually two pages listed of uh, oak species that are either small trees or shrubs or even ground covers. Uh, and um 
I know the ones up here. I don't know the ones for Florida, but they do exist. I think there's a dwarf live oak, for, for example. Uh, so it is possible to get a smaller oak and a smaller property. And if you want to know exactly which species are good for your area, again, send, send me an email and I will send you that, that information. The problem is a lot of these small oaks are not in the trade yet. They could be, but there's been zero demand for them. So uh, it might be tough to find, find uh, one of them, but you know, we, we need to create the, the market so that people start to carry them because we need to, we need to increase the number of species in the trade. There are 600 species of oaks worldwide and a third of them are endangered because many of them have very small ranges and they're just being encroached on. So we've got, to, we've got to get them into the trade so that people start planting these plants. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. When you have a small area to landscape, should you put in more of a couple of plants to support a population or try to diversify as much as possible? Another good question. Uh, small areas do constrain you. Um, the classic example is the person who wants to help the monarch and they plant a single ramet of milkweed. Then if a monarch comes and lays an egg on it, it's that single ramet's not enough even for one caterpillar. And a lot of times they'll lay two or three legs, eggs on it because it's the only milkweed that's there. Um, I've had, I've had people call me up and say, you know, I planted, I planted milkweed for monarchs, but worms got on them. So I squished them. <laughs> the worms of course are the monarch larvae. So don't plant a single milkweed. It will spread eventually into a milkweed patch, but um, start out with a milkweed patch. Put in a number of number of plugs. Milkweed seeds are actually pretty hard to get going um, so that you have enough for at least one adult female to come and lay her eggs and you, it doesn't wipe you out. Um, it depends on what the plant is. You don't need a number of oaks because oaks get so big that they make a lot of biomass. Uh, so you do need the minimal amount to support the creatures you're trying to support, but uh, diversity is good at two. So, so you need a compromise there and that will depend on the size of your property, but also think of your property as part of a matrix that is part of the entire range of, of that, uh, of the insects you're trying to support or the birds you're trying to support. You can't do it all on your, your one little property, but if you consider your entire neighborhood, now you've got a much bigger uh, set of properties. And it, and if you know your neighbors, you can divide up the, the goals. Somebody's gonna do the pollinators at one end of the street where there's sun. Somebody's gonna do the oaks at the other end of the street. Somebody can do the the understory plants and the berry making plants. And, and, um, and so think of your entire neighborhood as the ecosystem that you're restoring. Somebody, Maybe you can even get to know your neighbors. That'd be great. Someone asked if we have a butterfly garden, but notice most of our caterpillars disappear. Any advice on how to nurture their complete life cycle along with, along with birds? Uh, well, that may not be the bad thing you think it is. Uh, a lot of, almost all the caterpillars will reach their maximum size and then they disappear because what they did is crawl off the host plant in order to either form a chrysalis as a butterfly or to pupate. They want to get away from their host plant because they're, they're enemies, particularly their parasitoids, the, the little wasps that are always nailing and where the tachinid flies find these caterpillars by going to the host plant. So they want to get as far away from that host plant as possible as soon as they can. Uh, that's why I had a, a pipe vine swallowtail form a chrysalis on one of my um, light fixtures inside my house. It crawled about 50 yards across my yard, up in through the open door into my, my house. Um, so they do crawl a good distance. And a lot of people think they disappeared because they've been eaten where they really haven't. Uh, but remember, uh, they're part of the food web. So sometimes they do get eaten and that's normal. That's, that's what we want. Okay. Has there been a notable increase in populations of mammals and other wildlife on your property as well? Or will require different strategies? Well, like everybody else, we've got way too many deer. Um, yeah, deer are, are, are a big problem. But, um, you know, I haven't surveyed the, the mammals. I know we have a couple species of shrews. We've got, um, we've got bunnies. We've got breeding foxes. Uh, we've got groundhogs. We have mink. Uh, that's that's pretty good. We've got a possum that lives under the porch. We have raccoons. I guess we're doing pretty pretty well with with uh, mammals. Now, now in Florida, you've got neat things like bobcats. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but you know, when you increase the food, 25% of a fox's diet is insects. They're not just eating other, other mammals. Somebody sent me a picture the other day of a, uh, I guess it's a, one of the smaller species of copperheads in Texas. It's a caterpillar specialist. It eats caterpillars its whole life. Who knew? So there are other things that depend on insects, including caterpillars. Okay. Um, Jackie asks, what are your students working on now? Insects and birds? Uh, I have one student. Students are really expensive and, and it takes about $30,000 a year to support a student. So it's always a struggle. And he's just starting, but uh, he's going to tackle the question of um, how much plant material do you need to actually have, excuse me, a viable uh, moth population? If we're trying to increase the caterpillars in suburbia, let's say, um, and I'm saying, you know, plant, plant that single plant, plant the oak tree, what is going to actually find that and colonize it and, um, and thrive on it? Is it only going to be generalist caterpillars? Is it going to be specialists? Is it going to be a good mix of both? Is it only going to be the large species that can fly a long way? Um, so all of these are unknown, unknown questions, but it, the idea is to, is to generate the numbers that will describe exactly how healthy the, the uh, caterpillar community will be in, in a typical suburban neighborhood. So we're going to have transects uh, and, and trap moths from right, you know, the edges of cities right out to natural areas uh, to see how that, that moth population changes in diversity and abundance and, and specialization. That's his, his project. It's gonna be a big one and it's gonna occupy all of our, all of our efforts. Hmm. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, is there an optimal method strategy for planting in city centers? An optimal what? Method or strategy for planting in city centers downtown. You, you know, um, you do need places to plant. And that's the big channel, challenge in city, city centers. So uh, a lot of people don't own property at all. They're living in an apartment complex. And they're, they're experimenting with container gardening. Um, so milkweeds do well in containers. Joe pie does well in containers and butterflies will come and use those plants just in containers on your, your little porch in your apartment complex. Um, but if you have, if there is available property to plant in a, in a city, there have been very big efforts in Los Angeles and Philadelphia and New York, just for to name a few, they've called the million million tree initiatives trying to get more trees into our cities to lower the heat island effect, um, to do all the wonderful things that trees do. The problem is of course that many of those trees were, were non-native. It was such a wonderful opportunity to uh, really increase the, the uh, biodiversity oppor uh, opportunities in those cities. Uh, not all of them were non-native, um, but uh, so they were putting them on, on you know, street corners and, and the uh, street edges. It's always a challenge when there's so much cement around. The root systems are always constrained. But to uh, to do the best we can and get as many trees and plants into cities is, is very important. There's the misconception that native plants can't live in cities um, because they're not strong enough. I don't know what the argument is. Only plants from China do well in cities, which, of course, is ridiculous. Um we haven't looked for the native genotypes that would do well in really stressful situations. So for example, red maples, that's considered the maple of the swamp. But I can drive through the mountains of Pennsylvania and find red maples growing out of rocky crevices where there's almost no soil at all. That would be a perfect genotype of red maple to put on a street corner. You call it red maple street corner. And I bet it would survive that, that stressful habitat because it's already adapted to it. We need to do that kind of research to get more plants into our cities. Okay. Um, Mark, who manages a, a very wonderful park of ours, says, how can we motivate city and county governments to help implement these programs? Giving them some of the examples that you've mentioned already? or what? <clears throat> Yeah, you can give them all my book. That'll help. Um, but remember, these are elected officials. If they understand that these issues are becoming more and more important to their constituents, they'll listen. They want to be reelected. I don't want to be cynical about it, but they will do what you say if they're afraid of not being elected again. So we have to make it known to our public officials that these are important issues. Uh, almost all of them are, very few of them know anything about the natural world. They're lawyers or wherever they are, but um, they need to be, they need to be taught. 
Uh, so uh, it's going to be us who do that. Uh, and um, I have talked, uh, there was a, a meeting in, I guess it was Illinois. It's called the mayor's annual meeting where mayors from 50 towns in Illinois came to this one meeting and, and I talked to them and they all, they sat there with their mouths open. They said, we don't have any idea that this was going on. That's what we need to do to educate our leaders so that they realize that these are important issues um, that they never hear about. Um, we have a class from Temple University, a, a sustainability um, landscape architect class, I believe. Mm -hmm. Bess Wellborn Yates teaching, and she asks, is there a homegrown national park curriculum that could be incorporated? <laughs> no, there's not. Um, I'm getting that request more and more. Boy, I don't even have time to finish my email. Um, <laughs> there should be. I'm, I'm all with you. There should be, but I really need somebody to, to take that, or I can work with you and, and help get the right things. But you know, who? Everybody says talk to the kids in, in lower school and talk to the high schools, and and I agree. But um, it's a lot of work to put together a curriculum. So I'm all for it. Maybe I need to retire so I can do something like that. But I need help. Help me out. And good companion planting guides. Have you seen anything like that? <sighs> <laughs> um, you know, for native plants, you know, I don't want to say no. That's got to exist someplace. I don't, I don't know. I can't list a guide for you, but it's got to exist someplace. We should, we should track that down. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, you can find acid loving plants. So oaks like a lot of the oaks like acid. What other plants? Oaks and azaleas go together. We could, we could make up these lists um, without too much trouble. Some somebody, you need to talk to a real botanist. They could they could whip that out for you in a, in a flash. Um, someone mentioned Sue mentions Project Learning Tree as being a good curriculum um, for for kids. What's the name of it? Project Learning Tree. Project Learning Tree. That's for kids. Um, well, uh, we, we've got a few more that we didn't get to, but I think we got the main ones. And I don't want to keep everybody too late. So here is Dr. Talamy's email address. <laughs> this is why I don't write curriculum. <laughs> old email box. So be patient if you need an answer. Um, but this has been really wonderful. We really, really enjoyed it. That's great. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm going to. Um, in the broadcast and uh, you all have a great rest of the evening. <laughs>